Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, we learn how the increasing number of people coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan with shell shock are getting their rehab from fly fishing. The summer clay competitions have started. Our own fabulous Abby Burton will be explaining how to shoot skeet. It's known as the greatest dog show on earth and Somerset gamekeeper Melvin Hobbs would not disagree. He took his English Springer Spaniel Moly, officially known as Whitebrook Lord of the Rings, to Crofts at the NEC in Birmingham this year, and Moly took top honours in the working gun dog section. He won the North Esk Memorial Trophy. Melvin and Moly went head to head in the main arena with winners of other gamekeepers classes which were run at the event by the British Association for Shooting and Conservation. Congratulations, Melvin Hobbs and Moly. Since she came over and we put her hand out, I'd won. By that time it was heart was really pumping. Took her hand and what have it and she said to me that this way and I thought she meant going to a lap of honour like. Me and Molly were off. We were off because the adrenaline was pumping and I just felt a, a release run round the ring, come back and then got me trophy. The North Esk Memorial Trophy. Many, many congratulations. Melvin Hobbs and Molly. And then when you come outside, you've got all the cameras, the reporters and all the rest of it. And it was just absolutely mind blowing. Winning it and not expecting to get anywhere. I didn't expect nothing. And then going there and getting top honours, that was mind blowing. Did, uh, did Moly know what was going on? Um, he's been in shows before, he was a bit tired and I don't show him. So. He was showing me what to do, really. <laughs> and when we come out and they took the photographs of the cup, they put the cup down beside, and he looked at that and thought, oh, not sure about that. <laughs> I moved to one the side, like a bit shiny. <laughs> and a few minutes later, the wife come into view behind, and that was it then. It was, oh, the boss is here. <laughs> or as I call her, the management. <laughs> You've got to keep him fit throughout the year, haven't you? What do you do with him? He, uh, I walk him every morning and every evening, have a run about, do it, yeah, just, just generally walking in, keeping him fit. I still got plenty of keeping work to do. I've got the layers. Um, actually, he's in a run with two other dogs, and either side of them is there's two layers pens, so they're surrounded with pheasants all year round. So they they get used to them they know when they can and when they can't but this time of the year yeah it's, it's just well it's the boring time of the year i call it i'm usually on a holiday actually this time of year I usually catch up my hens for rearing then we're usually off on holiday somewhere because then it's work all the way through then once you, once they start laying it's it's the work time yeah. typical springer he's good He's slower than a field trial, but sometimes that's better because he'll come along the hedge afterwards and push a bird out. And if you drop something behind you in the wood, he's always the dog which is a bit behind, and then he comes back with the bird. You can't really tell him off too much. Um, he's just a soppy dog, really. That's, that's the one for best in the keeper's class, which entitled me to go on to the main arena. So that was the, the first rosette and that one. And then we had the main arena, which was the big silver trophy, which you're not allowed to bring home. Right. We set up the shoot here, just a little friendly shoot, one pen, bit of fun. And then it just grew and grew and grew. And it's still, we still got the friendly bit. It's still, the Mickey taking. Oh, <laughs> yeah. You might as well just throw your cartridges straight in, straight in the bin. <laughs> it's it's that sort of shoot. It's not serious, no. uh, but we can still go out. We still get a nice return on what we put in. A nice number of birds shot. Some really good bird shot. Some good fun. Lovely. Plenty of good food from Jackie's cooking. Now she's disappeared. <laughs> and plenty of cakes. Back to Molly. 
He might now be a living legend, but he remains unflappable. He may be the best, but he doesn't want to make a big thing of it. Best in show keepers classes, and that is, that's the one which stays on the mantelpiece at the moment. <laughs> so. It was a big year for gun dogs. As well as the ever-growing working gun dog section, the winner of the coveted Best in Show prize is a gun dog. Yogi is a seven-year-old Hungarian Vizsla handled by John Thurwell, who beat nearly 22,000 dogs across 187 breeds in the Best in Show competition. I am at Bellbrook Valley Trout Fishery on the edge of Exmoor in Devon with a fisherman called Tony Spacey who with fly fishing instructor Tom Hill began fishing for heroes to help rehabilitate people with post-traumatic stress disorder. I was told about this character Tom Hill who was giving his time away teaching veterans to fly fish as a way to help post-traumatic stress. Um, I found him, um, instantly got on with him like a house on fire and found everything I'd heard about him was true. I'm fortunate, I'm a former soldier who's got very lucky in life and in business. Um, I was so impressed with Tom, I said, well, there's two ways I think I can help you. I can either write you out a large cheque so that then you can give more of your time away, or better still, have you ever thought of forming a charity so then we can get lots of people to write you large cheques and let's help hundreds or thousands of people rather than individuals. We met in 2008 and we really started to get it together at the game fair in 2009 last year. Now there's obviously, you know, there's in name at least a link, fishing for heroes, help for heroes. Um, we're not interested in building facilities or creating facilities, although in some cases they are absolutely important. I can tell you a true story of six weeks ago, somebody came to give me a cheque and um, she said she was motivated to give me a cheque for £50 because her best friend's ex-husband had just killed himself. Um, the man was 46 years of age and, quote, he'd been a waste of space since the Falklands War. He'd left the Marines, he hadn't been able to settle down, um, he'd gone on the bottle, his life had fallen apart, his family, his marriage, he ended up on the streets. When I asked for his name, she told me his name and I found that I'd been on several courses with him and I'd known him. Well, he wasn't a dosser, down and out, waste of space when I knew him. He was a fit, motivated, professional young man. So we'll take two at a time. We teach them for three days. We will guarantee by the end of the third day they will be casting proficiently enough and have enough fishing skills to be able to visit any small still water in the country with a good expectation of catching fish. We also then try to connect them up with a former military person who's a fly fisherman so we can hook them up, if you'll pardon the pun, with a fishing mentor. Every penny of every pound donated is used to actually help veterans. The 100% of all the management and running costs of the charity are underwritten by the trustees. Well, fishing for me, um, it's the way I relax um, because it works in business exactly the same way as it works for post-traumatic stress. Um, my Blackberry is up in the car park in my car where it's going to stay till I get back there late this afternoon. Um, but it doesn't matter what stress, strains you've got, the moment you get a fly rod in your hand, that just goes because you have to concentrate on what you're doing. And I find the first 10, 15 minutes you're concentrating on your casting. After 15, 20 minutes you start to look around and you can enjoy where you are. And if you actually manage to catch a fish as well, well, that's just pure icing on your cake. It's a cold day and perhaps a little early for it, but Tony goes off for a spot of fishing. Then Tom Hill himself turns up. Well, I've worked with three people who suffered from PTSD. At the time, I didn't know that they suffered from it. And they came to me as regular clients and they, two of them have said how therapeutic they found fishing and how it's given them temporary relief from all the problems in, in their life. I then contacted a, a chap from the Royal British Legion who works with people with suffering from PTSD and we arranged about a dozen courses last year which proved to be very beneficial. Not for all of the people on the course but for a number of the people on the course. 
it was at that stage that I met Tony at the game fair and we started to discuss what we could actually do and, and that's basically how the charity was born. The difference between game fishing and all the other forms of fishing is that you're, you're constantly active, you don't have time to dwell on things. So it, it's not a magic bullet, it doesn't cure the problem, but it does provide, in, in a lot of cases, respite from the problem. Uh, and respite for people that are, are, are suffering from any form of illness is always very, very worthwhile. On the subject of Tony, how's his fishing coming in? Um, room for improvement. He didn't have to pay me a lot of money to say that. They both set about fishing. After all, the cameras are here. It wouldn't do not to catch a fish. After a while, Tony strikes and is into one. But then disaster strikes and the fish falls off. Desperate measures, Tony moves to a shore fire pool and is soon into another fish. And this one is a monster. Meanwhile, on another lake, Tom has connected. Back to Tony and the fishery owner is on hand to net it for him. He recommends the enormous trout goes back so there are guaranteed leviathans for an upcoming Fishing for Heroes event. Very happy. That's got to be a very nice double figure fish. Fishing for Heroes has raised nearly £20,000 so far in 2010. Tony's target is a quarter of a million pounds. Among fundraising events, Fishing for Heroes is back at Bellbrook on the 23rd and 24th of April. Tony explains. Chris Atwell, the owner here, has agreed to let us have the exclusive use of his fishery for two days. Um, we hope to be raising well over £10,000 over that two day period. Um, and we're having a fishing marathon. Have you got good support for this? We've got very, very good support. We're planning now to hold another one at the end of September because we've been having to turn fishermen away. Well, we need a fundraiser because it costs £500 per veteran. For that £500, we pay all their travelling, their accommodation, fishing tuition, we pay for their tackle, any rod licences, and it's not means tested. We don't care whether you've come out of a military and you're relatively financially wealthy or you're very, very poor. We take the view that you've paid your dues many, many times over by the service you've given to this country. The friendly rivalry between Tom and Tony is intense. Basically, I've let you catch my fish. Yes, I know. It's very decent, my dear. Oh, well, I'm a decent sort of bloke. It's a tiddler anyway. Call that a trap. Let's leave them at it. If you want to know more about Fishing for Heroes, visit www.fishingforheroes.net. I am here today teaching Jeanette Swift how to shoot English skeet. It's one of the most sociable and exciting clay shooting sports. Well, I saw um, an article about some shooting and I thought it sounded quite a good discipline and, and a, yep. a good new sport to do. So I used to do a bit of uh, pistol shooting many years ago. So. Okay, okay. What was that with? Uh, just friends and family? Uh, for in my work, in the in police. Work, yeah. In the police force? Yeah. Well. Right, okay, Jeanette, we're going to shoot English skeet today. Yeah. Um, we have a series of seven stands that are around in a horseshoe shape here that you can see. Yeah. Um, but we have two targets that we're going to shoot throughout. We have the high house skeet here. And we have the low house. Um, we will start over on station one, which is underneath the high house. Now the high house target is higher than the low house target, but they both fly across in the same pattern. Okay. okay? Yeah. Yeah. Why, why did you choose ski over, over track? Well, we tried the different things, didn't we? we did. And uh, I think like most people, you tend to go for what you're naturally good at. And, yeah. and I was, obviously that was a better, a stronger thing for me to do. For, so to follow. Ski yeah. Right, Jeanette, what we're doing now is we're going to set up our foot position for where we're going to actually break the target. OK, so your right foot is actually going to be pointing pretty much towards the area that you're going to break the target. Right, the next bit we need to do, Jeanette, is where you're going to start with your gun and where you're going to look with your eyes to first of all pick up this target, okay? So 
We've established that here, you see the green bin over there? Yeah. That's where you're going to hold the gun. Yes. And the eyes are going to be halfway between that green bin and the low house ski exit hole. Right. Okay. As you can see, there's some wood in the background there, and that's where we're going to fix our eye. Okay, Jeanette, we're going to go live now, okay? So I'm going to pop some cartridges into the gun. You're going to pop the gun up into the brake zone. Yep. You're going to wind back to your gun hold position, and then you're going to look back to your visual pickup point that we established earlier. That's when right. you feel ready, call for the target, and then we'll shoot it okay. as it goes. Okay. okay. So up into the brake zone. Good, wind back to your gun hold position and look back at where you're going to first see it. Pull. Through. No. Lovely. Oh, with that. Unload. It's quite big chunks. I, I would go into competition. I, I would enjoy doing competition. Yeah. No, it's all quite uh, it's all quite new, really. But I am a competitive person. I've done competitive sports in the back in the past, so uh, yeah, I, I could see that I might get get the bug a bit more here. Yeah. Station one, the high house that comes down over your head, and then you've got the low house in front of you. Station two, the high house. Now this comes out as a quartering crossing target, and you have the low house, but we're increasing the angle. Station three, you will only have two singles on this station. Moving on now to station four, we have pretty much the same. You'll see the hardest angle here. On to station five, we have just two singles on this station, a low house single and a high house single. Station six, you have a low single and a high single. You then have a simultaneous pen. And station seven, to finish on something that's quite nice and easy. It's the look of love, but it could kill you if you get your timing wrong. Heavy petting has seen the demise of many a male goshawk when they've not read the signals properly. So to avoid feathers being ruffled, it makes sense for someone to lend a helping hand. In this case, it's Roy. He's a bit of a gooseberry, but a very important middleman, receiving and delivering the right stuff at the right time. Artificial insemination has revolutionised the falconry world and Roy even has his own sperm bank. It's the family fridge. So what on earth is that rubber fried egg that Roy's about to strap on his wrist? With birds of prey, they don't actually um, insert to inseminate the females. They just deposit on the edge. So what we've got here is um, a pad. So as when the, when the goshawk comes over, and, uh, and starts copulating, he just deposits his semen on there. Um, and if we didn't have all the little indentations, it would just run off. So it's, uh, it's just a catch pad, really. First, we need to visit the donor. And he's quick off the mark. And what a racket. Sadly, he's all mouth and no trousers, and there's very little to offer, which is why Roy needs to add some extra volume to make the offering go a bit further. We got a, uh, a very small donation of semen there. It's not a lot we can use because unfortunately he did it right on the edge, but you can see that's the, the sort of amount that we're talking about. It's literally just a, the tiniest of, uh, of dribbles, but this male here has only started, started to, uh, to donate in the last couple of days, so the, the amounts that he's donating are really, really small. Um, so hopefully we'll get a little bit more, but with goshawks, you, you never get a lot. So it's, uh, it's quite precious stuff. The next male is a bit more jumpy, but does the job with Roy's encouragement. What we've got here is a, a male that's a few seasons old. Pick up, pick up, pick up. And just getting ready. And he's been our best, best donator so far. Pick up. Okay, so we've got a very, very tiny deposit out of that tiercel then. I think he was a little bit camera shy. So we'll just try and draw up what we've got. There's just about enough for insemination. We now have one half of the equation. Time for Roy to sow his seed. So there we go. So we've got just in there a, 
a good mix of semen and extender ready to go in. So the female, the female that's calling there is the one that we're going to go over and, uh, and try and inseminate. And gosh, he really does get his birds going. Good girl. As, as you saw with the males, it, uh, it all gets very exciting. When you think they only get a chance to do it for one month a year, then uh, you know, I think we'd all be pretty excited as well. Roy will do this three times a day for about a month to give himself the best chance of breeding some chicks this year. Spring has definitely sprung.